Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and I want to help you build a plan to become the kind of leader you want to be. Now, whether you are tuning in for the first time or are a regular listener, I'm glad to have you. If you want to be a nonprofit leader or maybe just more effective in the role you're in right now, you're in the right place. I'm glad to bring you these weekly conversations with nonprofit experts who really are on the cutting edge of our sector. Well, I got big news this week. If you are listening to this episode as it's released, we are less than one week away from the release of my book, also titled Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership. Go to our website, patmcdowell.com forward slash book, or you'll see that at the top of the homepage. Go to the book link and you'll see all of the ways you can get a copy of it. And for that, I would be most grateful. And if you're particularly uh, impressed with what you read, uh, write a review. It would help spread the word even further. And hopefully you'll find it helpful to you on your path to nonprofit leadership. All right, let's get back to the episode at hand because I had a fantastic conversation this episode with Stammy Despo and Tom LaFalce both from Cornell University, and while they are doing some fantastic work there in the area of fundraising, as both are part of the annual fund, particularly leadership annual giving, they added even more value in this conversation because they talked about creating the kind of team that I think every one of you listening wants to have, and that is, as the title of this episode implies, a people-first environment at your nonprofit. And they got into the details of exactly how you do that. And it starts with recruiting. It it continues with orientation and retention and professional development. And Tom and Stammy have great ideas in all four of those areas. Uh, You're sure to come away with some ideas that you can literally apply at your organization right away. Don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode. It's number 147. Just go to the podcast or the news page at patmcdowell.com, and you'll find all of the resources we discussed, as well as more information on Stammy and Tom themselves and the great work they're doing at Cornell. Speaking of resources, while you're on our website, make sure you connect with us, bottom of the homepage. It's called Free Resources. That should get your attention And you can sign up there and make sure you won't miss out any of the weekly episodes just like this one, as well as other information we have on nonprofit leadership, our programs, and other resources that may help you on your journey, including the next round of our mastermind. We're opening up applications for both the summer and the fall 2022 cohorts. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Stammy and Tom. Sammy, Tom, thank you for joining me on the path. We're so excited to be here. Well, it's great to join you today. Pat. No, thanks to both of you. I'm excited about this conversation, not only to learn more about the great things happening in, at Cornell, but frankly, both of you bring a passion to a topic that really is resonating with nonprofit leaders right now, which is taking care of their people, creating a culture that allows us to attract and retain talent And I know you both have been thoughtful about that, what you're doing there at Cornell. And I know that nonprofit leaders listening, regardless of what sector they're in, of course, you two are coming from the higher ed perspective, but any sector leader can learn from the good things you're doing. So thank you for that. And why don't we jump right into it? Sammy, I'm going to start with you because the last time you and I connected, in fact, it was episode number 27. Hard to believe, a uh, hundred and some episodes later, you had a fantastic episode talking about culture, in fact, but you were with Komen at the time. Tell us about your journey from Komen to Cornell. Thanks, Patton. It's really great to be here. I can't believe we're at, you're in the hundred plus episodes. It's fantastic. So um, I'm returning to higher ed from my days at UNC Charlotte, and I um, am here because Uh, My immigrant Greek grandparents stressed the value of higher ed and really sacrificed for their children and their grandchildren to have an education. Um, My parents were first generation students. It's great to be at Cornell. One of the reasons I'm here, there are many reasons, but one of them is, you know, we're solving big problems in areas of climate, sustainability, 
Um, there's a great fresh forward approach from students, professors, programming, there's research going on and experiential learning for the students. Um, we're here for the students, that's, that's really our mission. I love the alumni and advancement values that we have here, service, unity, respect, excellence. And of course we're in a campaign, so we have big goals, but the campaign speaks to me. It's about to do the greatest good. So it's about impact and, and doing good. That's awesome, Stammy. And Tom, quite a testimonial from Stammy, right? In terms of why people would want to come work there. And, and Tom, you're a bit of a unicorn, if I can use that term, <laughs> in, in that as a sector that has turnover so much, you've been at Cornell since you graduated. So talk about your journey and frankly, what has kept you there this long? Yeah, I, I started at Cornell back in the fall of 1990 and I got my degree in uh, 1994 in nutritional sciences, which I use every day when I'm like, oh, I should be eating my lunch right now. <laughs> um, you know, I'd say for, for me, um, you know, I, my, I started initially um, working in athletics at Cornell um, and I did that for 10 years, um, the last three of which I moved from sort of the administrative side to uh, alumni affairs and development work. And that led me to join our annual giving team uh, back in 2004. Uh, and I had a chance to grow in that role. I started as a reunion campaign officer and then I was a director of that program um, for a decade. And, and now I sort of work more broadly in leadership annual giving for Cornell. Um, I think there's a few reasons why I, I still stay um, at Cornell. I think the first thing is um, it's a chance to give back to an institution that's given me so much. Um, you know, it helped shape me as a person. Um, you know, my wife's family is from Ithaca, so we have family here and Cornell is a part of um, who we are. Um, I'd say, you know, our work helps Cornell provide a world-class education. Um, our students, alumni, and faculty go out into the world and they make a difference, right? They're trying to help us solve some of the world's greatest challenges. And it's really exciting to help make that possible, even if it's only in a small way. And I, I think the last part is the people, right? It's right. The, the alumni that we work with, the donors that we work with. They're just such interesting, amazing people who really want to help us make a difference. And, and then I think, you know, so that's important. But then there's also the people that I come to work with every day. Um, you know, we're really lucky in that we have um, a team that is really committed to the work, um, that cares about what they're doing, that's supportive of each other. And I, I just, I, I've enjoyed working with people over the years. And, you know, I think back to some of the people I've worked with on our team that have gone on to do other things. And it's, I find that really rewarding. That's fantastic. It's hard for me not to get excited. I spent 10 years in higher ed, as you two both know, and hearing the enthusiasm that comes from you all uh, makes me think about those and, and what I enjoyed in particular. And, and Tom, I guess a follow up question to you is that while you've been there 25 plus years, you, it sounds like you managed to keep it fresh. In other words, I'm thinking for a listener thinking, you know what, I just can't imagine staying somewhere for a, that long a time. But but you've had distinct kind of differences in your career path, it sounds like it's kept you energized. Is that fair? Yeah, and I think it's so important. And as we talk about professional development later on, I think just that opportunity to grow, to try new things, um, you know, we're lucky in that we're a really big organization, right? I mean, um, so there are always opportunities to try new things. And, and I've been able to work with people who've given me you know, who took a chance on me. And I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more, I'm sure, as we move on in this conversation. Yeah, fantastic. Indeed. And again, I want our listeners to get their wheels turning because you two have framed this conversation in a wonderful way, talking about creating a people first environment. And that is, I uh, should be front and center for nonprofit leaders everywhere. But I think there's struggle in doing that. And, and you two have given us a great framework to think about mentally here, the four aspects of this concept, kind of how do we recruit, how do we orient, how do we retain, and then develop our people. And you have, of course, ideas in all four of those areas. But Stammy, let me start with you, because you've worked in different nonprofit sectors. Obviously, when you and I first met, you were in the healthcare arena. Now you're back in higher ed. But what have you learned about kind of identifying and attracting talent? 
So it's so important, right? I think it's a two part thing. It's the brand of the nonprofit, right? And what do you stand for? What's your mission that would attract talent, right? And then what do you do to attract the talent as a brand? Um, so I think some of the things that are important are being visible in the community, um, whatever that community is, and, and having high integrity so that people um, can trust you, right? And wanna work with you. Um, having your why, your mission front and center. So again, uh, people understand why they would work with you. Um, taking the time to really listen to talent that's interested in coming with you. And I think keeping professional development and people first, you know, that whole ethos front and center. So if you're branded that way, um, it's going to help retain, I mean, not retain, but attract the talent. Um, so I think those are some key points. Yeah, I love that. I'd underline that point. You getting the message out there, there, there's a bit of a marketing element, isn't there, that in, in your community, wherever it is, your organization needs to be present because that, in fact, sends a message to potential talent uh, to consider this opportunity. Now, Tom, you had a built-in affinity, right? You articulated beautifully that, hey, this institution meant so much to me and my family, so perhaps there was a natural connection, but do you, as an institution of higher ed, look for fellow alums or how does that affect kind of your thoughts about recruitment, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's nice, but I think for me, I, I find people, I'm interested in finding people who have passion for the work, right? You know, I was really lucky that Cornell took a chance on me. I, I literally got um, started my work career. I started in the mailroom, right? I, wow. <laughs> sorting mail and was my work study <laughs> job, right? So right. I, I think so much, I had a passion at that time for what I was doing. And I, I think what happened for me was that I was the right person at the right time. Opportunities just sort of kept coming. Some of it was just circumstance, um, but people sort of saw something in me and let me then sort of grow and take on new responsibilities. So, you know, when I think about recruiting people, I want to see people um, that, you know, are willing to take initiative, that, that want to learn, that want to grow. Um, you know, one of the questions that, that I like to ask for people is, tell me a little bit about um, your volunteer and philanthropic interests. Nice. I, I find that people who sort of have that interest, um, they may be applying for a, a very entry level position. But, you know, in our organization, I've taken a lot of, um, you know, pride in the people who've started as, you know, administrative assistants on our team and were interested in and learned the business and gone on to, to actually build a career working. And many of them are still at Cornell. And, um, you know, I, I find that really rewarding that, you know, we might lose them off our team and I may not see them in the hall every day, but, you know, I still get to work with them. And I, I think that, you know, giving people that bigger understanding of what we do, um, you know, you'll find people will catch that bug. So, I mean, I think it's a passion for Cornell. I think people who went here have that. Um, but I also think that, you know, if you're passionate for what Cornell's trying to accomplish to go out and make a difference in the world, um, you know, you can pick that up very quickly. Yeah, Tom, I love that. And because, you know, as a candidate, I'm going to answer the job description type questions, right? But you're going to ask me about my passion outside of the job, which probably is more revealing and perhaps will get at the fundamental enthusiasm you want from this job or from this candidate. Is that fair? Yeah, well, and, and I also think some of it, you know, if you have those experiences as a donor or as a volunteer, it helps you shape how you work with donors and volunteers, right? Indeed. You want to be treated, you know, you want to treat people the way you'd like to be treated. And, um, you know, so if you have experience, for example, you know, working on a board, um, you know, you may have a sense of what you expect from a, a staff member to, you know, provide clear direction, to set clear expectations, um, I think that really is a, is a skill that really connects well to the work that we try to do, because it's all about connecting with people. Indeed. Well, Stanley, let me come back to you on this topic. On this topic, is there a question you've used? You've hired a lot of talented folks or had to evaluate talent. So I like Tom's question. But is there anything else you kind of look for 
when you're recruiting and then ultimately interviewing and trying to hire somebody? Yeah, so I'm really interested in uh, curiosity and inquisitiveness, right? Yeah. So after the why that Tom talks about, I'm, I'm interested in getting to where's their initiative and drive and how are they um, curious because things change all the time in the nonprofit space and um, you have to be able to adapt and adjust. So that becomes really important to me. Um, and good one. question to ask around that would be, you know, like, tell me a time when you learned something new. How did you go about it? Or if I gave you a project, what would you do? What would the steps be? You know, not really interested in the answer, but in the process and the, the curiosity that goes with it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah. How someone creates a thought process or how they seem to work mentally, I think is a great way to reveal how they will be as a colleague and ultimately successful in the role you're recruiting them for. Um, all right. Well, we've tackled kind of some of the assessment of talent and what we look for in bringing talented people. Tom, clearly Cornell's doing a good job in terms of orientation um, and onboarding, I'm sure that's important, but let me ask you that exact question. Yeah. What do you think is important to, uh, successfully onboard or orient someone new to your team? Well, I think the first thing is it's critical to have a plan, right? You can't really wing it. Um, you know, our division, you know, puts together a series of orientation meetings, um, that cover many of the things that every employee in our division should know. Right. And then we supplement those meetings with other conversations that we think are relevant to the position. Um, we'll meet frequently in the first few weeks to cover the basics and start to develop a strong working relationship. And for me, at the start of each of those meetings, I, I ask the person to tell me about the orientation meetings they've been having since our last meeting nice. and to see if they have any questions on those conversations that I can help them answer. Um, and then from there, I, I try to develop, especially in the early days, you know, a list of items um, that I hope to cover in each one of our meetings. And sometimes they get pushed to meeting because we don't get through everything because there's lots of questions. But, you know, eventually sort of settling into a, a weekly meeting where, you know, that person's the one driving the agenda, not necessarily me. I know I'll have chances to get out the things I want, but to have them drive the agenda to make sure they're getting what they need. Um, and then I think the, the last thing that, I, that we do that I think is really critically important is um, we have a pretty strong culture of giving every um, new staff member what we call a buddy. Right. And the way I think about that buddy is that that person's available to help orient them and, and help them feel like they belong to the organization. Um, and that it's sort of someone I, I've described it to people as you know, someone that they can ask a question that you might be embarrassed to either ask in a meeting <laughs> or to ask your manager, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I don't want my manager to know I'm asking that kind of question, but it's someone who you can rely on to help you either, you know, understand the culture of the organization or, or something really very specific um, that might be uh, helpful. So I, it's, a, it's a long process. And, and in our business, I find that, you know, it really takes a whole year through you know, to really start to understand the role. So that whole first year is about learning what we do. That's fantastic. As someone who came to an organization and frankly didn't know who to talk to, I remember that feeling. And you're tiptoeing around wondering who you can confide in for those questions that you're right. I'm, I'm not confident enough to ask it in a staff meeting. And so you are providing that buddy, which I think is fantastic. One more follow-up, Tom. How long is the formal onboarding process you described a series of meetings is it is this a six-month thing or a three-month thing or year long or does it vary i guess depending on the position um i guess it we're usually getting a lot of it done in i'd say three to four months okay um you know there is probably one or two things that always um will go a little longer than that you know so for example some of the meetings um, may only be scheduled quarterly. So depending on where you joined, you know, you, you may not have got everything in in that period of time. Um, and then our, our learning is ongoing, right? So, you know, uh, I think it was last week, the weeks go so go by so quickly. But, um, <laughs> we had a, an all staff um, week last week where we have a series of professional development opportunities and they can be about specific things. So it could be about, you know, what's the latest and greatest things about our campaign, but it could also be things about, you know, how to be a better presenter, um, you know, for a meeting or how to, you know, um, to become a better public speaker. So, right, right. Um, so I think that's ongoing for all of us. 
Yeah, that's good. And of course, yeah, you both are sensitive and uh, proactive about professional development. So it's not a, you know, time limited process that's ongoing. And in fact, Stammy, you've been through previous onboarding and orientations. Obviously, you've just gone through it fairly recently at Cornell. What was it like and what helped you, I guess, as you ponder the onboarding process? I think the onboarding process is so important, right? It sets the stage for future success. So onboarding in a virtual hybrid environment, this was my first time doing that. And I have to say, like from day one, um, I, I was given swag, which I think is really great and important. Nice. The memo. Um, and uh, I always do that when someone starts it. Uh, my mentor had done that for me. It, it leaves a, a nice feeling. And if that person is starting virtually, then I guess send it in the mail. You know, it, it felt good. Um, and we got a book to read called Mindset, The New Psychology of Success by Carol Dweck. And I had read that book, but I, I was really thrilled to get a hard copy book that kind of talk, like shows what this division is all about. Um, so I appreciated that. I think um, the other thing is that we had a, a 90 day plan. So I really like a 90 day plan when you're onboarding, where you do it with your manager and you figure out, you know, what are the goals for that 90 days? Who are the stakeholders that I need to talk to? What do I need to learn? Um, who do I need to meet with? And it's a, a roadmap. You can adjust the 90 day plan, but it's something to get you going. Um, and then of course, like Tom said, the, the buddy mentor system is invaluable, right? And hopefully it develops into a real uh, great working relationship with a colleague um, on the professional and the personal side. And I have a great buddy um, at Cornell and I you know, have met her for coffee. Um, we talk on Zoom. She's a great resource. So um, all of these things come together to really make the onboarding experience uh, in, uh, successful. I love that. Multiple takeaways there. One, you know, Stammy, I'm a fan of the book um, because every, every episode of this podcast, I'm asking for book ideas. In fact, Mindset is one of the books we send to our mastermind participants. So funny you mentioned that book. So I'm a big fan of it. But I appreciate the touch you said Cornell offered you. Swag, sending you some gear, making you feel part of the team right away, giving you a gift connecting you with someone, just as Tom suggested. So to me, those are fundamentals that everyone listening ought to think about in ways that I, even in a virtual environment, you can create engagement. And in fact, let's segue to that topic, Stammy. Um, you've always been a big proponent of team engagement. And so it sounds like Cornell is already doing good things to quickly get you engaged. So are there other things they're doing or that you have done previously that you might offer to our listeners around kind of team engagement? So, you know, this is an area that I really care about because if we want to put people first and have sustained success in our nonprofit, then how do we, you know, how do we engage with our colleagues? And so there's so many tactics and strategies that you could do, but I think some of the key things are like listening first and really listening to understand um, and that asking for feedback um, right from the get-go. I'm not shy to ask my colleagues, my team, how am I doing? This is where I need help. Um, we just, uh, Tom mentioned the All Staff Professional Development Week. There was a book that was mentioned, The Art of Gathering, How We Meet and Why It Matters. So, you know, talking about like, what are our values? What are our customs when we have a meeting? Whether it's hybrid, virtual, um, in-person, you know, how, how do we engage with each other? And then thinking of people and colleagues as thought partners, right? Not, um, not boss and, uh, you know, employee, not supervisor right? and yeah, employee, yeah. but partners in, in the process. I think goes a long way. No, oh, excellent. And and Tom, you were great in identifying some of that professional development. It sounds like that is instilled early when somebody arrives. Well, you tell me, how do you continue that kind of employee engagement, especially around professional development? Is that something as a new 
employee, I'm going to be given those opportunities or how do you help me frame my professional development path? Well, I think it's really important to be willing to allow them to tell you where they want to go, right? If you don't understand what they're thinking and where they want to go, how are you going to help them build to that, right? So, you know, I think that that gives you an opportunity to have conversations about, you know, are there skills that they're looking to develop to help make that role a reality? Um, you know, then you have an opportunity to, you know, to be able to help them find ways to learn those skills. Um, you know, if, if they want to go out and become a gift officer, um, you know, perhaps as a volunteer manager, um, you know, you can, you know, work with them to say, well, let's try and make sure that you're doing, you know, 25 solicitations this year. And, and that might be not quite in the job description, but you're going to try and do that as part of the role. So really being willing to put that out there and not, and not in a way where they think you're just automatically trying to get rid of them, right. but how you can help make their current role an opportunity for growth and prepare them for where they you know, want to be. And, and then I think it's also, again, we're lucky that we work in a, a big organization you know, to help them connect to people that might have already gone through that path, right? To have a conversation, you know, if I want to become the lead of a, a fundraising group in a college, you know, well, here, here's a person I would recommend you talk to to understand what their path is like, and they might be able to give you, um, you know, their insight. And, you know, perhaps it, that, that will help you, you know, figure out what you need to develop and how you need to grow. Um, I think that's important. And, and you know, another thing that, that I've told people I've worked with, and, you know, I'm not actively managing many people at this point, but there was a time where I was managing, you know, upwards of 10 people at a time you know, is to say that I'm here as a resource for you, you know, as you pursue other roles, right? Yes. To, you know, to be willing to say, you know, I'm happy to sit down and do a mock interview with you. I've done that with, with people before. To, to, you know, to say, you know, let's, you know, how can I help guide you through thinking about is this the right opportunity for you or now, right? Because sometimes people come with, you know, a great opportunity that's a really great match. And sometimes as a manager, you might say, hmm, are you really ready for that? Or do you really think that's the right role? And let's talk through that. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are afraid to talk to someone they work with as their manager about, you know, another job. But like, we're not, you know, more and more, I think people are not looking to stay in roles for 20 years, right? Right. So one of the things that I can do, and quite honestly, it's in Cornell's best interest if I have that conversation, because maybe that's an opportunity to keep them at Cornell. It may not be in the same role, um, but if they're happy and can continue to progress here, better that than to lose them somewhere else because we weren't willing to have that conversation. So well put, Tom, and I'm impressed. You made an earlier reference to helping people move up, even if that means move out of your department, your team, your unit. Um, because let's face it, if we don't provide professional development, they're going to leave anyway. And so you're being proactive and say, hey, let me help you. And I just think that creates such a dynamic environment. People are going to come want to work in your team because they know you're looking out for them in their long-term journey. I, I worry some nonprofit leaders, maybe it's subconscious, but they don't want to help you advance too much because they don't want to lose you. And, and Tom, just to repeat that, right? You're saying, hey, I realize I might lose you, but ultimately it's good for the individual and for Cornell at large. Well, and, and I found too, it, it helps our program, Right. I take great pride in the number of people that worked on our team that are now off working in different colleges or that are working in our donor relations team now or that are working in, um, you know, in our advancement services team. And you know what? That helps to get exposure for our program. Like it helps spread the word. Great and then point. when people talk to them, they can say, oh, I really like working there. And they helped me, you know, sort of along the way to get to where I am today. So I, I think it's valuable in so many places. And you know, you just want people to be happy and feel, you know, valued right. and, and like that they can, you know, really make a difference. And, you know, some of these positions, I think, I always think, I, I guess I bring a, a bias that, you know, annual giving, if you're going to work in this profession is critical to understand every, I think everyone would really benefit greatly from getting that foundation. But there are people who get that foundation and then take it off and go into a different direction. And, and I, I enjoy that part. Well put. And your point about you're creating ambassadors, in essence, if they move on there, they will reflect fondly of their experience. And that that's wonderful, because now people are talking about your organization, your annual fund team or whatever. 
Uh, so delighted that you're lifting that up. And Stammy, let me come back to you for one other question, because both of you are experienced, successful professionals, but I know both of you are still thinking about your own professional development. So Stammy, can I ask you that question? You and I've talked about it before. How do you continue to, to get better? Or do you have an approach, I guess, through now Cornell as to how you're going to continue to build a professional development plan? Yeah, I love that question. So, you know, I have a manager and one of the first conversations we had was about my professional development and, you know, to keep my curiosity and my um, my goals in mind. And so she was very quick to, to make recommendations of resources that were at Cornell. And I'm actually doing some executive coaching that they provide for leadership and actually for anyone. And um, I'm really happy to have that one-on-one -on -one time every other week with a trained executive coach who can lead me in my new position and, and provide feedback and, I, and be a resource for me. So this is a conversation that's part of our agenda, ongoing agenda when I meet with my manager. And it's a conversation that I have with my direct reports that it's in their agenda. So, uh, yeah, we have to look out for ourselves and for our team. That's yeah. my job. Yeah. That's Love weird. that. It's built in, isn't it, Stammy? You, yeah. you literally have a built in. And again, not every organization listening, the leaders listening, have the infrastructure of a university, but they could put some of those same practices in place, right? Absolutely. And, and like that. when I was at Susan G. Komen, um, you know, we did that at the affiliate level, you know, this was part of the conversation with our team. And we brought in professional development people to speak on different topics. And we talked about it. And I had people that left the organization for bigger, better jobs. And I was proud of them. You know, yes. I was happy that um, we had been able to do that and that they had grown professionally and that they were moving on. So um, that's the name of the game. And especially if you're putting people first and you're looking for sustained success. Yeah, very good. And I hope, again, our listeners are thinking about what can they do to replicate some of these concepts you two are bringing forth. Um, speaking of concepts that uh, have appropriately gone across the landscape of this country and the entire world, frankly, have been the focus on racial equity, diversity, and inclusion. And Tom, I wonder if you could speak to, because I'm sure you're part of conversations across campus that Cornell is indeed sensitive to this. So what are you doing in, in that space? And I'm sure that does affect, you know, both current talent and the talent you're trying to attract. I think one of the things in this space that's really important to understand is that um, these conversations can be difficult. Um, and that you also get better with practice, you know? And, and so I think for me, you know, I was really fortunate um, to grow. I grew up on Long Island. I, I had a diverse group of friends that were, you know, exposed me, you know, I had a, probably one of my closest friends who actually came to Cornell with me and we actually became fraternity brothers. And we were, you know, one of my closest friends is, um, he was born in India. And, you know, so I got to know his parents were, you know, they spoke at home in their native tongue. And I had that exposure, right? And I think so much of it is that when you're exposed to people that are different from you, the more often you are, I, I tend to think of people as um, basically inherently good, yeah, right? And that sometimes it's just feeling uncomfortable and not wanting to say the wrong thing. And the more times you have those exposures to people that come from different perspectives or different backgrounds, the easier it gets. Um, you know, one of the resources that we've had at Cornell um, that I find really excellent is we have a group called Site, which is the Cornell Interactive Theater Ensemble. And it's a group of trained actors um, and they will come and we, our division has done some, um, some role plays with them where they come in and they act the part of a donor or an employee um, and you know hearing and often what ends up happening is we have someone from our team that will role play with those actors um, and have other people watch and we give feedback on how you would handle the situation or how you would have that conversation um, you know we've had those conversations about you know um, a supervisor who makes an insensitive remark 
right. or overhearing a remark in the hallway that was inappropriate and how to, how to you know, um, intercede in that situation. Um, uh, we've done sessions where uh, a fundraiser goes into a conversations with a donor and um, that, um, that donor acts inappropriately and how do you deal with that situation? Or when that situation does happen and, and someone that works for you comes back and says, hey, I just had this meeting with this person and um, you know, they tried to buy me a drink and asked me if I wanted to go out after the meeting. <laughs> right, um, right, you know, right. So having that opportunity to try and have those conversations in a safe environment um, and think through how you would deal with those situations if you were ever presented with them, I think that that makes it easier. And again, you get better at it the more you do it. Um, and that doesn't mean that every single one's going to be easy. Right. Um, but I think for me, I always try to come at it from a perspective of, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing. And if and if I did something that insulted or offended you, um, it was not my intent. And I apologize. And, and I'm sorry that I made you feel that way. So I, I think there's a lot to be said for that. Well, it, it's fantastic. And I'm intrigued by that that group on campus, the acting group, because I love role play as a means of training and learning and all that. And so you're saying, Tom, I can reach out to that group on your campus and, and you can give them scenarios that, hey, I need we want you to come to our team meeting and, and role play this scenario and they'll they'll come ready to go. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we've actually um, some years ago, we hosted um, an Ivy Plus annual giving conference at Cornell. Um, and we worked with them to come in and talk about just doing an initial discovery visit. So we gave them, you know, we worked with them to develop sort of a, a profile of who they were as a donor. Um, and then we would have people come and just sort of role play an initial conversation with a prospective donor. Um, you know, so yeah, we work out the scenarios with them and, and have the opportunity to put a program together. It's fantastic. Uh, and again, makes me think, and I hope our listeners are thinking about ways to create opportunities to practice because you said it well, Tom, these are not always easy conversations. And the best way to get better is to practice and to put ourselves in situations where we can work on that and hopefully be a better at what, you know, often can be difficult conversations. Um, Stammy, back to you. Any final thoughts on the issues of diversity? Again, you've been part of multiple organizations. Anything else you would like to add to that? Well, I would say that um, I agree with everything Tom said. It's an ongoing process of education and training, right? It's not one and done. It's like always learning, always trying to do better. One of the um, things that was last week that really struck me is there was a panel on first generation students with students and donors speaking. And it was so, it was educational, it was eye-opening, it was impactful. So like finding opportunities within your organization to, to share your mission and, and people that are different but same as you. Um, and then one of the tools that I've recently come across that I really like is this inclusion dial for um, going around like thinking about inclusive meetings and how people feel within a team. And there's like these four levels, right? Are you safe, which is the first one? Then do you feel welcomed? Then celebrated? And then at the, the, the full dial would be cherished. Do you feel cherished? Right. And so like, you know, asking your team perhaps, you know, where are you in this dial? Um, might be eye-opening, right? We were asked that last Absolutely. Week. And then how do you move people from safety to cherished, right? From the very basic where you have trust to the very high level of cherished. So I think that's interesting and, and like a, a guiding star for people that are um, leaders or even individual contributors, you know, like, how am I feeling right now? Do I feel safe? Do I feel cherished? And then asking as a leader the same thing. Stammy, that's a great tool. Uh, I love that tool. And again, it just forces a self-awareness as a leader to make sure we're checking in with our team because we may assume they feel all four of those levels, but I, I bet in many cases they don't. And we have to be willing to engage in that conversation for sure. That's a great point. And I also think like it takes a lot of work and being purposeful to go to that higher level of cherished 
right. or celebrated and cherished. Like that takes a lot of work, right? It's not just going to happen. Well, again, like everything you both have brought to this discussion is fantastic. Indeed, you have fulfilled kind of the objective here, talking about the people first environment, recruiting, orienting, retaining, developing, engaging, cherishing, right? Stammy ultimately is what the kind of environment we want to create. But both of you also know we got to raise some money, right? And so while it is important to have a good culture, um, what I'm, I'm encouraged by, though, is as you create a culture, you indeed can help generate affinity and ultimately investment. So, Tom, let me ask you that first. You mentioned earlier, Stammy did, that you're going into a campaign. So what does all this mean for getting ready for a campaign? Well, you know, I, I think you, you need everybody on a team to be a part of the campaign. I, I, I think one of the things that I've realized is, you know, campaigns are long, right? And so, so yes. you're, gonna, you're gonna have staff that are gonna leave and others that are gonna join you during that campaign. You have others that will take on new roles later on in the campaign. Um, you know, so I, I always try to think about, especially when I'm working with someone new, you know, to help them understand the context, right? How does the work you're doing right now contribute to this overall thing we're trying to do as a campaign, right? So, you know, the, the, the thing that's, you know, the person who's entering into the database, the visit report, you know, from a meeting, you know, why does that help us get to raise the $5 billion we're trying to raise in this campaign? Right, um, right. You know, to, to show how the different pieces fit together because, you know, as this campaign moves on, and if this is someone who does take initiative and does want to grow their career, you know, you want them to be able to quickly move into a new role so that, you know, we've got a deadline here, right? So if we have our staff, everyone on our team, regardless of what their role is, understand the campaign and why we're trying to do it, I think that helps you be successful and move through because, you know, these camp, for, for a place like Cornell, we're, we're talking about an eight year long campaign. Wow. You know, so it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a long time. It is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, so I think just that constant understanding that, you know, everyone can play a role in the success of this campaign and, and that, that, that impact might change throughout the length of that campaign. Yeah, and Tom, it reinforces your point of creating a culture is what is going to allow you to retain this kind of feeling for the long haul. You know, we can't have temporary quick fix kind of culture amendments here because we got to make this for eight years and we've got yeah. to make sure people feel good about it. Yeah, and I also think that, again, we're lucky, and I, I didn't say this in the beginning when we talked about why we stay at Cornell. Um, we're pretty good at this, right? right. I mean, right. we're really lucky in that we have, you know, people that are experienced fundraisers who've done it for a long time. You know, we're, we're an institution that people want to get behind. Um, you know, all of those things, you know, we have good bones to our program. So we, can, we, can, we need to continue to make it better. But, you know, I, I think if we, we can put together a good plan and then we operate against that plan. Right. So for us in annual giving, you know, we're we're hoping that we're going to be able to grow our annual fund, you know, uh, up to sixty five million dollars by the end of this campaign and to raise four hundred million dollars for our annual fund over the course of this campaign. And I know because we're we're going to be able to work with our colleagues and, and have good partnerships with other parts. It's not something that we can do alone. It's something that we need everybody's help with. Um, and, and I know we're going to be successful because we have so many good people on our team. That's fantastic, Tom. Well, Stanley, I heard a lot of zeros in Tom's goals there. So are you ready for a campaign? And, and Absolutely. thoughts on yeah, getting yourself ready and your team ready. Anything else you'd add to, to Tom's points? Well, I would go back to what you um, started this conversation around campaign is that it, the culture will drive positive results. So if you put your people first, I know this from experience with other organizations, then you get the the dollars will come right so i think that's the first thing i, yep. I yeah we're here to raise a, a lot of money with a lot of zeros like you said Pat. <laughs> so again i you um really just reinforcing your mission and keeping your goals front and center and then take care of your people and then get in the get out of the way of your people empower them 
to, to drive results, right? Because this is a team effort, right? As Tom mentioned, it's a marathon. It's also a team sport. There's so many partnerships that make a campaign successful internally and externally to the organization. Um, so it's all hands on deck. And I would also say we need to celebrate. We need to have fun, right? So we got to celebrate little wins and big wins. Um, I used to do this thing called Wednesday wins. And it was like basically share anything like personally or professionally that just makes you feel good, you know, nice. that you body trained your child or you got a new pet or, um, you know, whatever it is. And it doesn't just have to be about work because let's face it, we're in a work life situation right and so both are important um well put so, and yeah. why not have fun right sammy and, and, and right. It, we have to have fun yeah all right well great points and, and both of you again have added a lot uh, i'm looking at my notes here of all that i'm taking away from this conversation sammy i'm gonna give you the first shot at the last round um as you know you've done this before uh, give me a book that's been meaningful to you that you'd recommend and maybe any final advice for someone thinking about nonprofit leadership. And then, Tom, I'll give you the same opportunity. Well, again, Pat, and thank you for um, having us in this discussion. So important. So I'm going to uh, two books. Uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why. I said this at my last podcast with you. It all starts right. with why. why are we doing something? Why are we here? Why, why, why? Let's let's keep asking that. And my new favorite book is The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, A New Paradigm for Sustainable uh, Success. And the word that's key there is sustainable, right? What are we doing to make sure that our organizations and our people are sustainable, right? Um, yes, yes. So, uh, and I love this book. Um, I'm using it in my executive coaching. They also have videos and um, we talk about it in our team meetings. You know, they have this very simple concept of a black horizontal line. And are you above the line or below the line? Yes. You know? Yes. So, yeah. So I'm going to leave there. And then I guess my final thoughts are that um, along those lines, uh, I think as a nonprofit, People, we have to take care of ourselves and wellness um, professionally and personally front and center for ourselves, for our team members. And we, um, I'm asking myself every day, am I above or below the line as a leader? It's great. And uh, both of those books on the shelf behind me. So Stammy, you and I are definitely uh, reading from the same list and I would commend those to our listeners as good ones to really rally around. And Tom, I'm sure you've got some good to share as well. So give us something to think about to adding to our reading list and maybe some final advice you'd have for our listeners. Yeah. Now I know I'm dating myself um, when I, <laughs> I say this, but I'll never forget um, a weekend seminar I attended while I was a student at Cornell that was called leadership in the 90s um, <laughs> and um, wow it was it was taught by ken blanchard um who oh, was yes. a cornell grad and uh he wrote an early leadership book called the one minute manager and um i still think about that book you know the thing i, I enjoyed about them they are incredibly quick reads you know they're a couple hours you can be through it and you know as part of that course um he showed scenes from some really popular movies. Now, again, dating myself. Yeah, right. right, right. Mo movies like Hoosiers and The Karate Kid, right? And showing how that caring mentor can really make a difference in someone's life. And the emotion it stirs up in you when you watch those movies, um, those those really stick stick to me to this day. And, and, um, and it's also not the fact that, you know, I think we had three feet of snow that weekend and it was the first time <laughs> Cornell closed in uh, about 20 years. So, but that, that, that book really sticks out to me and, and what he's done and the opportunity to have, you know, um, heard him speak then and, and actually meet him several times since then and, and hear from him has been really rewarding. Um, I think in terms of other advice for nonprofit leaders, um, I'd say, don't be afraid to learn from the other programs that you look up to. Um, 
in my experience, we work in an industry where people are fairly transparent. Yeah. You know, most people are willing to share their experiences and their insights about the work that they're doing. Um, you know, when I tell people that we meet as annual giving teams with other Ivy League schools, they're, they're surprised. They're, well, that's the competition. Right. Um, but, you know, I remember a conference we hosted at Cornell back in 2003 when when we heard from Columbia about something new they were trying called Giving Day. Um, and, you know, we started one shortly after that. Um, and we've learned a lot from it and we've grown through it. And, you know, last year we raised over $10 million and got gifts from over 14,000 donors in 24 hours. Wow. Um, and, you know, we're getting ready to do our eighth giving day coming up in a few weeks. We very much look at it as an opera, as a, a project, you know, we kind of know the drill now on how to do it, but we use it as a laboratory to try new things. Um, and I would encourage others to, you know, not be afraid to ask other people what they're doing that they find successful, because I think most of the time people will be willing to, to give you a little bit of their time to talk about what they're doing. It's fantastic. I love to finish here with a collaborative encouragement, right, Tom, that even if others might view it as competitive, there is more collaboration than I think than there is competition in our sector. And I'm delighted you bring it up. And while Stammy raised the bar pretty high on good books, you added one that was over the line too, right? I love that. <laughs> Blanchard is on my shelf. And and to me, really uh, nice, to, a book that has kind of stayed with you even after all these years. That says a lot about the One Minute Manager. So uh, Stammy, delighted you put this uh, conversation together. Thank you for again being on the podcast. Tom, delighted to welcome you to the podcast. This is going to be a, a fantastic episode to share. Tom, let me ask you in closing, yeah, where can people go to find out more about the great things happening there at Cornell? Yeah, probably probably the best bet, as, as we mentioned a few times, um, we are uh, we publicly launched our uh, university-wide campaign called To Do the Greatest Good. Uh, and you can view our website at the www.greatestgood.cornell.edu. Fantastic. Stammy, Tom, thanks for joining me on the path. Thank you, Patton. Yeah, thank you, Patton. It's been a great conversation. Really appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Stammy and Tom as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas that can guide you on your professional journey, but also make you perhaps more thoughtful about creating a people-first organization. Don't forget about the show notes available on our website, patmcdowell.com. You can find out more about Stammy and Tom's work at Cornell and Stammy's previous appearance on the podcast. It was actually episode number 27, and it's one of the most popular episodes we have had across now almost 150 episodes. As always, please share this episode with someone else on the path. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to this podcast. Just go to the podcast page at patmcdowell.com and you will see the follow button featured prominently on that page. Follow equals subscribe. So thank you for doing that and make sure you get each of these episodes as they are released on Thursday mornings. Don't miss out on any of them and you will find even more great conversations. If you want to go to the podcast page again, click on the episodes button and you can scroll through any of the episodes, including the two referenced in this week's uh, production, as well as many other great conversations that we have been fortunate to have. Now, thanks again for all you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. Keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time on The Path.